Welcome to Science on Tap, Manaqua. Um, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea that was conceived in 1905, that the borders of the university are the borders of the state. At Science on Tap, you won't get a lecture, but rather you have an opportunity to hear some uh, interesting research that's been going on and then get to ask your own questions. So I'd like to remind you about our partners in Science on Tap. We have um, the Lakeland Badger Chapter, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Trout Lake Station, part of UW-Madison, uh, Kemp Natural Resources Station, also part of UW-Madison, uh, the Manaqua Public Library, and then our hosts here, uh, Manaqua Brewing Company. Um, and we are supported by a grant from the Brittingham Fund, so thanks to those folks down on campus. And a reminder that there are four ways to watch. You can obviously watch right here. Uh, you can also uh, watch over at the Monaco Public Library with Mary Taylor, who has snack leftover Halloween candy, I hear, tonight. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if, you, if you need something like that. Um, we're also streamed at a couple of other libraries um, around the area. And um, we also have live video streaming, so if you want to stay home or you're in Florida for the winter or whatever, uh, you can watch, if you've got a good enough internet connection, you can watch right from your own home. And then finally, we, you can watch any event later. We uh, videotape everything, and um, so not only can you watch the whole presentation, but we also create a seven to eight minute short version, and you can watch that if you just want a sample of the opening comments and a couple of questions. Our next Science on Tap event will be December 5th, and our speaker will be Brian Haringa speaking about bats. Kind of a sad story, but, um, but it should be very, very interesting. Um, tonight, we are privileged to have Dr. Katherine Kramer. She's the author of an extraordinary book, The Politics of Resentment. Rural Consciousness in Wisconsin and the Rise of Scott Walker. She'll tell you about her book, but let me just say that I found the book fascinating, eye-opening, and I hope we have it at the library or you go out and buy your... I'm sure you want us to go buy your own. And <laughs> <laughs> libraries are great, right? Um, anyway, it was a fantastic book, and I really hope, uh, if you haven't read it already, that you go a very, very interesting, um, relative, very relevant to today's world. So, um, about Dr. Kramer, she grew up in Grafton uh, in southeast Wisconsin. She comes from a family embedded in football. Her dad was her high school's football coach. There was never any doubt she was going to go to UW-Madison, and her household was politically active with lots of politics around the dinner table. Her mom served on the local village board, and she was the first woman to do that. And Dr. Kramer started college, sure she would study art, uh, but she wandered over to geology, and then into paleontology, and finally swung back to political communication during the 1991 Gulf War. She got jazzed by a young professor in a class on public opinion, and she was hooked for good on political science. Okay, so here's your qu trivia question for Kathy Kramer. Kathy Kramer has toured all over Wisconsin, talking to people from every corner of the state. Her most memorable tour happened when she spent two days touring the state with what famous person? A, Brett Favre. B, John Stewart. Or C, Bernie Sanders. What do you think? John Stewart. <laughs> Dr. Kramer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a true story, yes. It is so nice to be here. Thank you so much. It's, it's really, thank you for inviting me, Hank, wherever you are in the room. Um, it's just, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to be in Minocqua. So thanks for having me. I am uh, a lifelong Wisconsinite. You can hear it in my voice pretty quickly, probably. I have an accent, people tell me. Um, and I am a professor down at UW-Madison, and I study public opinion, American politics, public opinion. And I'm a little bit unusual in that respect because it didn't take me very long in my studies and my career to realize that if I really want to understand 
what people think about American politics, the best way to do that is to listen to them, right? Actually spend time with people and, and try to get a sense of what's important to them, what they value, how they talk about politics with their friends and, and neighbors in the places that they normally hang out in. So about 10 years ago, I had just earned tenure, and I finally was able to do the study that I always wanted to do, which was study political understanding or how people interpret politics in this state that I love. And so I, at the time, I was really interested in how our social class identities matter for how we interpret politics. And that's just a social science way of saying, how is our sense of where we are in the pecking order of things? How does that affect how we think about issues and candidates? And so what I did was to sample uh, an array of communities throughout Wisconsin, 27 in all. And I knew that once I had sampled a place, I was going to invite myself into conversations in that place, uh, conversations among groups of regulars. So I had sampled 27 places around the state, and then I called up a local newspaper editor or one of our fabulous extension agents and said, where in such and such Wisconsin do people go on a regular basis that I might get access to, that I could invite myself into their conversations? And they pointed me to gas stations and diners and sometimes places of worship, sometimes a McDonald's, just dependent on the community. So when I started out, I was visiting urban places, suburban places, and some of our smaller towns. And about a year into doing this, I realized that what I was hearing in the smaller communities was both really surprising to me, and you're going to laugh, and many of you, a lot of what I'm going to describe is very familiar to you, but it was surprising to me because I grew up in, in Grafton, as, as Susan said, which I had always called a small town, but not really until I started doing this work did I realize, oh, a 7,000 person town is not a small town in Wisconsin. <laughs> So what I learned was uh, about the kind of, a kind of resentment toward the cities in this state that a lot of folks in smaller towns in our rural places feel that was widespread. I heard it in all different corners of the state, and I thought it was really politically important. So I'm going to explain what that sounded like a bit and explain how I see how that has mattered for our politics in the past 10 years. Um, and a little bit about uh, how it mattered last night, I think. But just briefly, you might be wondering, okay, so here's this political science professor driving out to these communities in Wisconsin. Like, how did you do this? How did you get access to people? Well, it was pretty simple, actually. Once people had told me, okay, at 5.30, for example, every morning, there's a group at Joe's Gas and Sip, they're there every day, you, you know, just walk in and introduce yourself. And so I'd drive out in my Volkswagen, pardon me, I mean, I'm about as Madison as you could possibly be, <laughs> driving out in my Volkswagen, I'd walk in and I'd say, hi, I'm Kathy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Do you mind if I join you this morning? And people generally welcome me in. I mean, usually they would say things like, well, sure, we've got nothing better to do, pull up a chair, you know? <laughs> And then I would just ask them general questions like, what are your concerns these days? What are you all talking about? And we would go from there. But what I heard in our smaller communities were things like, you know, all the attention goes to Madison and Milwaukee. Like, all the decisions are made down there. You all are all talking about yourselves. You don't really understand what life is like in a place like this. You come through as tourists. You might even spend the whole summer here, but you don't really know the challenges that we face. And they would also tell me things like, our taxes are so high here, and you know, you city people, you come out, and you buy up all the, the lake frontage, and you build these big vacation homes, and drive up the property taxes, and we've been dreaming about living on the lake all our lives, and we can't afford it. Or we've had to sell that home or our relatives have had to sell their home, or our friends have had to move away. And their sense was that all the resources, all the wealth, really, was down in Madison and Milwaukee. And then, I think what was most heartbreaking to me, and probably the most important in the 2016 presidential election, was people's perception that those folks down in the cities, in Madison and Milwaukee, 
making all those decisions that affect our lives. They don't know us. They don't understand what life is like here. And they don't actually even like us. They don't respect us. They think we're uneducated and unsophisticated and racist and so forth. And so in all those different ways they were telling me, we are on the short end of the stick time and time again. We love our communities, but we're a little resentful about what we're not getting. And we're working really hard to make ends meet, oftentimes multiple jobs. Or sometimes people would explain, you know, you all think we live in this beautiful tourist land and we live high off the hog, but the fact is we work our rears off and when the weather finally gets good, <laughs> we don't have the time to enjoy it. So they were saying, we don't get our fair share and we think we deserve more. We're working really hard, we're playing by the rules, and we're not getting what we deserve. So that was really eye-opening to me. I thought I knew this state but I didn't know that sentiment. And it seemed, as a political a science professor, really important politically because it sets the stage for someone to come in and say, you're right, you do deserve more. And you know what? The, where, what you think you deserve is going to other folks who don't deserve it, who aren't working as hard as you. And in many ways, Scott Walker resonated with that sentiment in that respect. And so for him, a big target was public employees, people like me, other folks uh, down in Madison, but also people within every community around our state where he was saying in various ways, you know, public employees have it really good. They have decent salaries, they have health care, they have pensions, and they're the haves. And the rest of you, you're the have-nots, and it's, right, it's about time that we kind of right that balance. And then when Donald Trump came along, he was saying a similar kind of thing, not making public employees a target as much, but in his own way, saying, you know what, you do deserve more, you're right to be so upset, and you know what, it's their fault. And he wasn't pointing at public employees, but he was pointing at immigrants or folks in China or Muslims, different targets of blame. So. It's not a happy story, what I have to tell you, right? But yet there is, um, there is some happiness to my experience doing this work. One is, again, like I'm driving out to these small communities. I'm learning all about resentment folks have to those folks down in Madison, people like me, right? And yet they're welcoming me in. And 45 minutes into a conversation, the first time I meet them, they're saying things to me like, you know what? You're the first professor from Madison I've ever met, and you're actually kind of normal, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so in, in some ways, doing this work has been a real eye-opener for me to just how much um, we actually can get along if we have a moment to listen to each other. But another big eye-opener for me was people were nice to me in that first conversation. But the second time I would show up, they would say, hey, you came back. And the third time I would show up, they'd say, you're really serious about this. And kind of giving people my time, or I should put it differently even, showing people that I really cared about what was going on in their lives by virtue of taking the time to show up and come to them conveyed so much. And I will tell you, in, in the year since I, year, couple years since I published my book, I've had a lot of interaction with politicians from various sides of the political divide. And oftentimes they're asking me, what are people in rural Wisconsin telling you? Tell us what they're concerned about. Tell us what they're thinking about. And it's a shocker to me because I think, wait a minute, they're your constituents. <laughs> Don't you know, or don't, you have, don't you have a sense of what people are concerned about? And I realized, you know, in a very personal way, that one of the things that's really broken in our political system is that ability for our representatives to spend time with us and to listen to us and to come to us and sit down at the gas station or wherever and say, what are your big concerns around here? Some of that is 
a large part of it, I think, is the, the role of money in our politics and just how much time they all have to spend raising money in order to get reelected. I mean, they're starting today, right? Folks who were reelected last night. But another, I mean, there are other parts of it too, just that for a member of Congress, on average, they're representing 600,000 people. You can't listen to all 600,000 people, right? But I would say the, the biggest uh, spark of hope for me is um, just how many people are concerned about these same things that I'm concerned about. So when I started working on this book, I was just a lone political scientist really interested in what folks in Wisconsin thought and were concerned about. And then I published my book. And lo and behold, it became much bigger than me. And I think it's because there's so many people in this state that believe in this state as a place where we do care about each other and we want to be decent to one another. We haven't always gotten it right. We're still not getting it right. But we do want this to be a place where ordinary people are heard and matter in our democracy, and we want to be good to our neighbors. So by virtue of you all showing up tonight, you're restoring my faith. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And um, you can probably tell I really love knowing what's on your minds and listening to you. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, there's so many trends affecting rural parts of the state. I grew up in a small town, the reservation just um, 15 miles away. Um, when I think about it, the um, economics yeah. um, that have changed the aging of the population, yeah. the loss of the young people that get educated and often don't come back. Um, and I've learned that there's also issues where Wisconsin has prided itself on local control, um, and yet shared revenues haven't kept pace in the past 30 years. So um, in terms of educating folks about these really complex, some of which are global trends, um, is there a forum that you see might be helpful to, realize, to help folks appreciate how complex all of this is? I mean, there's some people put forward um, simple solutions, yeah. but there really aren't um, simple solutions to these changes. Yeah. I'm not quite sure about the specific forum, but what I do know is that all of the information in the world is not going to get across to people unless they perceive that it's coming from someone who cares about who they are. And I think a lot of times um, I experience often in talking about this work, I'll, I'll explain what I heard and then people will say, yeah, but don't they know? Or don't they realize that? And it's, um, and my response is, uh, it's not a matter of facts, really. It's a matter of people perceiving that they're being condescended to or being told that they're stupid or ignorant and don't know what's good for them. And I think whenever information is packaged in that form, of course people are going to tune out, right? I do it too. So I don't know the specific form, but I think it's the, the matter in which the information is conveyed that's the ticket. So maybe if this kind of information is conveyed in a sense of, um, I hear what you're saying, I hear the challenges that you're facing, and here's why this information could actually make your life better, and here's how that could actually happen. Thank you. Um, since you... Um, closer? Okay, thank you. Um, whether it's a new governor or a previous governor, let's say the governor calls you in tomorrow and says, you know, our state is pretty divided. And I know you have an ear to what's going on out there. What advice would you give to the governor, whether it was the old one or the new one, yeah. to help him bridge the divide that we're all yearning to get rid of? We want to get back to where we could compromise and work together. What, would, what advice would you give a governor? I would say you need to work with um, people within communities and 
establish a way for people to have uh, repeated face-to-face -face interaction with people whom they don't agree with. And it's time intensive and expensive because it's time. And it's going to take a while to repair those divides. But there's no, there's no better remedy than having a face-to-face -face conversation with another human being in which it's, it's not about the issues, but instead it's about, tell me your background. Tell me who you are and what you care about. And then we go from there. And that sounds really Pollyanna-ish. I realize, but I absolutely believe in it. And I, I have seen it work in, in many respects. I've seen it work in my own field work. Um, and we we've all exper have experienced that at times, when we've had a connection with someone we never thought we would connect with because we've had to, we've had to engage in face-to-face -face interaction with those folks. I would also say, though, that there are some of us who have the luxury of listening and face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, those of us who have the luxury and the ability to do that should engage in it. But it's not for everyone. I mean, because the nature of the divides these days are such that, I mean, they're so awful in some respects that I would never suggest to some folks that they put themselves in physical danger by kind of reaching out and spending face-to-face -face time with someone who um, thinks, for example, that they're less than human. I mean, some of the racial divides are... Um, it's not the kind of thing where you would advocate someone put themselves in danger by engaging with someone who um, is showing really horrific racial, racist attitudes toward them. Um, but for those of us who can spend time with folks who disagree with us, uh, we should give it a shot. And also, one other thing I would add, in that kind of a situation, I mean, I had the luxury of listening to folks, meaning I didn't, in these interactions, I didn't go in uh, feeling the need to persuade people to think differently, feeling the need that I had to argue back. All too often, when we get into a situation when we're with someone we disagree with, we, we get into this mode where we get defensive and we start preparing for how we're going to respond. And it takes a lot of energy and it's really hard. But instead, if you just allow yourself the luxury of not having to respond back in that moment and instead listen, you actually learn more about where the other person is coming from. And one other thing I would mention is that when you find yourself in that situation of encountering someone whose views you just really don't, agree with. A really good strategy kind of buys yourself some time and also buys yourself some understanding is to say, tell me more. Tell me why you think that. And then see what happens. So I don't know what governor would adopt that as a program, but I would give it my best shot. <laughs> okay. Hi. So, okay. The idea of talking to a governor and saying um, to listen to what people are saying and to any of us. Um, my concern is how much misinformation, lying, has been going on. And mm -hmm. these stories are killers to, uh, to making good sense out of who to vote for or I mean, you were talking to people, and you said it was a luxury because you could just listen and then go make your notes and, and leave and think about it all. Mm -hmm. And you weren't trying to influence anyone. And that was important for your study. But for us to move forward into the next election, which is going to be tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, and how do we... How do we address that kind of resentment that comes from people listening to things that aren't true and yeah. believing them? They believe this stuff. Yeah, I mean, some of it does, right? Just, I mean, out and out misinformation, lies, myths. But sometimes, um, to address it, it helps to know where people are coming from. 
And I'll give you an example. So one is that sometimes people will say to me, okay, the folks that you talked with in these small towns in Wisconsin, don't they understand that actually they're getting more than their fair share of taxpayer dollars? Don't they get it that actually they're, they're not paying more into like the collective pot, either on the state level or the federal level, uh, than they're getting back? And I say, okay, here's the thing. Like, you can do the calculation. You can look on a per capita basis how much people are paying in across Wisconsin counties to the state uh, taxation or, and to federal taxation. And you can look at what counties are getting back. And yeah, it looks like our more rural counties, if anything, are getting more than their fair share. But that's only one way of looking at it, right? Because when you look at household, median household income across our Wisconsin counties, the level of unemployment and the poverty rates, lo and behold, our rural counties have it the hardest, right? And so when people say to me, like, they don't understand that they're actually, they have it pretty good, I say, well, that's a different interpretation of the facts than the one that people actually experience because they're not seeing the calculations of how much is going in per capita and how much is coming back per capita. What they're seeing is that they're unemployed, that they can't pay their bills. And so that's not as concrete an example as, say, a, a specific fact about... Um, the, um, the exact amount of money that was allocated for a given policy. Um, but it, my point is to say that sometimes one person's set of facts, if you, if you listen to their own perception of the world and of those facts, you can understand why what they're saying might sound like a misperception, but it actually makes a lot of sense when you understand where they're coming from. But another point on when you hear like a, a blatant uh, misinformation, I learned pretty quickly that the worst way to respond was to say, that's not right, <laughs> right? Because in my experience, driving out this social scientist from Madison, people would talk to, like, for example, they'd tell me about how the, the enormous number of out-of-state students at UW-Madison and I would say, well, that's not right. Like, actually, there's a state statute that says it can't be any more than about 26% of the student body. People would roll their eyes. They would go, there they go again. Here's another person from Madison coming out here and telling us we don't know what's what. And that was the end of the conversation, right? So what I learned is that maybe the worst way to correct a misinformation is to say, you're wrong. Instead, it helps like, for people to know you and for you to say, huh, okay, tell me more. Tell me why you think that. And then say, you know what? Here's how I've been thinking about that these days. And then see what happens. So, um, whoa. <laughs> so the um, uh, recession of 2008, which preceded with the Walker campaign of 2000. 10, it seems to me that that was uh, kind of led into a lot of the resentment that was being felt in the rural areas that, and you were just touching on that, but the um, unemployment rates in small towns, and, and we know from in northern Wisconsin in particular, it's very high, 15, yeah. 18 percent in the counties, whereas Madison really never experienced uh, extreme unemployment. So I just wondered if you wanted to speak a little bit about the role of the economy, and you did someone yeah. already, but um, w it was really a slow recovery in rural areas, and it really hasn't yeah. recovered. And then yeah. the second issue that's, I think, related is the opioid crisis that used to be an urban problem, but uh, during the last 10 years become a rural issue. Lots of small towns, there weren't other jobs. Right. Um, opioids sort of filled a gap there from a couple of different perspectives. So I wonder if you could speak to those two things. Sure, thanks. So I started my field work in 2007 before, I mean, there were the seeds of the recession, but it hadn't really kicked in, you know, 2008 was really when Bear Stearns collapsed and so forth. And um, even when I started, 
people were already expressing a lot of resentment toward public employees. And so even before Scott Walker came on the scene, I think that's important to say, that people were feeling, they were feeling really economically stretched, right, even before the recession. And when I'd go back around during the recession, I'd ask folks, you know, so how is the economy doing around here? And I remember one time, not far from here actually, a group of folks said to me, oh, it's pretty good. And I said, oh, really? Like things are picking up? And they said, well, no. I mean, we've been in a recession for 30 years, so it doesn't really matter, you know? <laughs> and so what I learned is that the recession, in many respects, didn't register a whole lot among the folks I was spending time with because they were already in a recession in their minds. And I don't even know if recession is the right way to describe it, but it's so economically stressed, right? Um, but one thing I've seen happen is that as many of the urban places around the country and in the state have recovered in terms of jobs, that there's, there's even more resentment in a way because people get this news, I mean, hear the news stories about the economy recovering, and they think, oh, it is? <laughs> Where? Show us, right? The jobs aren't coming back here. And it's just kind of underscored several things. One, just how much of um, different worlds we live in, in our urban spaces, in our smaller rural spaces, and also how the news industry has such an urban focus. And uh, it kind of just overlooks some of the issues that, are, that uh, folks in our smaller places, smaller towns are facing. With respect to the opioid crisis, um, It's such a personal thing for so many people. I, I guess my big response to that is just um, the nature of the conversations about the struggles people are having with uh, with opioids. Um, just it, there, there's there's really nothing, no other issue quite like it in the way people just with their body language and and the. It's so personal, right? Almost everybody, it seems, has some story about how it's affected them personally. Um, and I, I guess I don't know what else to say besides that, except that it's probably a huge part of the crisis is just how much um, people seem to turn inward about it because it's, there's often such a personal sense of loss around it. Um, uh, and I, you know, obviously it's ca caught in the attention of people around the country, but uh, it, it's, it's just an epidemic that, um, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, it's, it's such a horrible, really heartbreaking thing that is, I mean, in all, in all corners of this state, I think it's touched people. Question back here. Yeah, doctor, <clears throat> I got two questions. Why did Tony Evers win last night? And why did yeah. Scott Walker lose? Yeah. And are the answers the same? The other second question is. It's <laughs> <laughs> enough, Carol. <clears throat> That's enough, Courtney. <laughs> the other question is, some counties vote the same all the time. Now, looking on a computer today, Bayfield County, Washburn County, and Ashland mm -hmm. County are rural counties. Yeah. And they always vote strongly Democratic or blue. Yeah, yeah. Where all the counties around them voted mostly red. Right, right. Why is that? Yeah, oh, fun Thank questions. You. Yeah, sure. So I, I'm still, still puzzling through the returns from last night like a lot of people. Um, but I think uh, a lot of why Tony Evers won and Scott Walker lost has to do with uh, on-the-ground turnout efforts with respect to both the Democrats and Republicans. So in that respect, it's the same answer, but in that respect, it's also a different answer that I, that I think 
my sense just from looking at the, the numbers I could see this morning was that turnout was really strong in the, uh, the blue areas of the state, especially Dane County, Milwaukee County. Um, the Scott Walker loss, I mean, there's, there is speculation about the tie that was made between Scott Walker and Donald Trump in some folks' minds, but there's, there's not a great not a great way at the moment to know whether that actually meant some people didn't vote for Scott Walker or whether or not there's people who voted for Tony Evers who may have voted for Walker one of the past three times he was elected. It's a little too soon to tell. Um, but I think, I do think that Foxconn hurt Governor Walker and I do think the condition of the roads and issues around our public schools hurt Scott Walker in the end. Um, Hard to say how much. Uh, that's my guess in that respect. Um, that northwest corner of the state, fascinating, right? So there, there's a variety of theories for why that, that corner of the state is democratic. And I'll say there, there's a gas station I spend time in, in, in that corner. And I remember as a group of loggers, and uh, some of them retired, but some of them usually on their way to work. And I remember one guy walking, <laughs> coming in, and I was asking folks about you know, their partisan leanings. And a guy came in, and he said, yeah, I mean, you guys are, you guys are loggers, and you're voting with the tree huggers. What's with that? <laughs> you know, kind of ribbing his friends for voting Democratic. But some people say it has something to do with the ethnic heritage in that part of the state, that there's the strong ties between the Finns in particular and the Democratic Party historically. That could be part of it. Some people say it's the Duluth media market and some, some of influence from that media market. Other folks say it has to do with unionization and kind of a, a holdover of folks who are unionized in that part of the state. It could be all those things together. Hard to know, but it is it is an interesting part of the state. Really interesting, yeah. Uh, in your book, you say you're not your goal was not a cause and effect kind of study, but rather yep. a descriptive study. And you did a great job of describing the rural Thanks. mindset, which pretty clearly is different from the urban mindset, I would suppose. But I'm going to ask you: Is that a good thing or a bad thing for our democracy? And then secondly, if it's not a good thing, yeah. what do we do about it? So is it a good thing or bad thing that there's different mindsets? Yeah. I think it's a good thing. I mean, generally, if people have different perspective on life, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a bad thing when, as is currently the case, we overlap sort of how people look at politics with uh, who people are as human beings and start to equate folks on the other side of the partisan divide from where we are as, as less valued, less valuable, less worthy of respect. And that's happened before in our past, but I, I think it's more intense now than in the recent uh, past, and that's... that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. I mean, really, as a democracy, when push comes to shove, we're making decisions about each other's lives, right? And at a minimum, we have to have some level of respect for the people whose, whose lives our votes affect. And when that stops being the case, then is it really a democracy anymore? Good question. Yes, I have more of a comment than an actual question. Please. And one of the things is the amount of money that got spent on political ads is absolutely absurd. Can you imagine if that money did go into repair of highways, roadways, bridges, and mainly schools? What a difference that would have made. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. 
thank you for coming to speak to us. It's been a while since I read your book, but as I recall, the quid pro quo from the University of Wisconsin for you taking time off was to explore the uh, perception out here of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Could you speak to that? Sure. So, yeah. Can you repeat that? Sure, sure. That, uh, the question was, uh, it's been a while since he read my book. He said, thank you for reading it. <laughs> uh, and he said, if he remembered right, that the quid pro quo from the University of Wisconsin-Madison for giving me time off that first year to start my research was while I was out and about in the state to ask about perceptions of University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so in every conversation, usually toward the end, I would ask folks, you know, what do you think UW-Madison does well? What do you think it does not so well? And what do you wish it were doing in your community? And what I heard generally was people had a lot to say about what UW-Madison does well. And they would say, generally in this order, they would say, love the football team, love the basketball team, love the hockey team, love the marching band. And then they'd say, love those extension uh, uh, educators, those extension agents, even though at the time they weren't part of UW-Madison, although now they are. Um, love the hospital. Uh, it's a great place to get an education. Yeah, it's generally a really good school. And then I would say, okay, so what do we do not so well? People had a lot to say to me and very specific things. And it was generally, it's too expensive to get in. We can't send our kids there. What are they thinking? We can't afford to send our kids there. They would say, um, it's too hard to get in. We have this A-plus student here in this community who wasn't allowed in. What's going on there? Uh, they'd say it's, you know, big party school. <laughs> they'd say those faculty are lazy and liberal and elitist. And yes, they knew I was one. And they were basically saying, you know, it sounds to us like you all don't work very hard down there. And so you, Kathy, <laughs> what are you doing? Driving around the state, having coffee with us? Like, how is that hard work, right? So that's one of the things I heard. Um, there was also, uh, at times, concerns about how folks do research uh, out and about in the state. Um, a sense that, you know, you come out here to do research, but you don't explain to us what you're doing, and we'd like to know. And actually, we might have some wisdom to share with you all about what you're up to. Um, so I learned a lot from those conversations. And maybe one of the biggest eye-openers to me is when I got to my third question of, what do you wish people were doing? at, at UW-Madison were doing in your community, they oftentimes didn't know what I was asking. Like they would say, you mean like recruit, come, come around here more to recruit our kids? Or I'd say, well, yeah, but you know, what are your big concerns around here? Do, is there something that you can imagine UW-Madison UW doing? And they really didn't quite know what to say until I would say, like, for example, like you, you loggers, you're always talking about all these wood chips that are left over, and you're always wondering, like, what could be done with that? It just so happens there's this big biofuel research engine down at UW-Madison. They're trying to figure out how do we make fuel out of wood chips. And then, and then they would have all kinds of things to say. But it took a while for people to realize, oh, the university is supposed to, like, be a part of our lives? beyond educating, educating our students. And I think we at UW-Madison have learned a lot from that particular point of view that there's a lot more we can do to convey to people we are about educating young people in this state, but so much more. And we learn so much from you when we listen to your concerns and we can come up with ideas together about the research that we can do, about programs we might create to actually improve your life right here. Thank you for the question. Hello, yes, I just had a question about what your perception was about uh, what people might have said about public media or their source oh. for uh, learning about their community. Yeah. I moved here recently from basically Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul area, and I missed that newspaper. Oh. And I noticed when we were in the Madison area that that paper just wasn't as robust as I remembered it when we lived there many years before. And it concerned me 
And then I also realized my children don't have televisions. Um, they read uh, newspapers, but a lot of things that they learn, they seem to be very up on things, but it's online. Yeah. And it's very different from my usual way of learning is the public newspaper. The small town mm -hmm. that we moved to, I noticed, had a robust small paper. But um, to me, to have uh, local people covering local school meetings, local politics, did people talk about that as far as how they're, I tend, I'm ashamed to listen to the news that I agree with, and I try to be more open-minded and listen to stations I may not necessarily agree mm -hmm. with, but how did that play into what you learned and how people are communicating today and how that may or may not help people hear those delicious points of view yeah. that they might not agree with but yeah. are valuable? Yeah. Well, definitely at the local level, there's been just a real decline in the news available to all of us, right, regardless of the size of the community in the state. And that the local newspaper is in, in many places a thing of the past, unfortunately. When I ask people where they get their news, I mean, to go back to the early part of your question, people had a lot of very positive things to say about public media in this state, especially public radio. And especially when you get towards the Twin Cities area, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who live in Wisconsin along the western side of the state who feel like they're really at a loss for news about Wisconsin because they're in the Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul media market. And they say, you know, our television news comes from Minnesota. It's hard for us to get news about Wisconsin, except through uh, public radio, Wisconsin public radio. But it's, I mean, things definitely have changed a tremendous amount in terms of where people get their news. And you're right, that it's, it's very rare for a young person in the state to be subscribing to a print newspaper, right? Um, and more and more people across all age ranges are getting their news online. Um, th it is an issue for us encountering opposing points of view or just different points of view because it used to be the case we all pretty much got our news from just a handful of sources and we were all exposed to kind of the same information. But then cable television, uh, online news, now we just have a greater ability to select into the kind of information that we want to hear or see or listen to. And it, it, is, um, it means it just takes that much more effort to expose us expose ourselves to points of view that are different than the ones that, that we're used to. So it's a common phenomenon um, across the country uh, as well as in the state and in particular the, the, the loss of a, a local news source means that um, Oftentimes, the, the level of politics that we most easily can get involved in and actually can make a difference in our lives, we have the, the least amount of information about. So it's a real problem. Um, I don't have a solution at the moment, but thank you for raising it. Um, you've researched uh, a lot of the resentment that's uh, out in the rural areas. And I'd just be interested, uh, what are your thoughts on resentment of, uh, you know, the elite folks that live in the urban areas uh, about how they feel about the, the folks in the rural areas? Are there any resentments yeah. that, uh, that you feel, you know, being one of the elites that you are? But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, one of the things that happened to me after the 2016 presidential election, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. So on election night, like a lot of folks, I was at an election watching party. And for me, I was with a bunch of political scientists. And we're watching televisions with all of our laptops open. And we're watching returns. And lo and behold, you know, the, the lines on the, for example, the New York Times website showing that the probability that Hillary Clinton's going to be the next president of the United States and the probability that Donald Trump's going to be the next president of the United States cross at some point in the evening, right? When people realize, oh, actually, it's not going to be Hillary. It's going to be Donald Trump. Well, I went home early, scooped up my daughter, and I, I thought, well, I probably should get to bed because I think I'm going to be busy tomorrow. 
because I get home and I check my email and lo and behold, there's an email message from the New York Times editorial page saying, hi, this is the New York Times. We missed something. Can we talk to you? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and so I, I lead off my answer with that story because the, it, that, that election changed my life because not that many people had been paying attention to what's going on in rural America, and especially not with respect to public opinion about politics. So a lot of people started communicating with me, including people I had never met, but who had read my book or heard me talk and felt the need to tell me what was on their minds. And a lot of that came from urban elites, from Wisconsin and, and elsewhere. And, and I got so many emails that at some point I decided I need to make a research project out of this to justify the time I'm spending reading them all. So I started analyzing what were people were saying to me. And this is what I learned, that a lot of these emails were just gratitude, like, thank you for writing the book. I understand better now, blah, blah, blah. But about a quarter of them were resentment towards rural folks, as you, as you are expecting saying things like, um, how can they be so stupid? Um, uh, don't they understand that agricultural subsidies are a government program too, and why would they want less government? And then I would try to explain, well, you know, you know the percentage of people in a rural community that actually receive agricultural subsidies is about 2% on average, <laughs> you know, and try to explain. Um, but then they would also say things like, I grew up in a rural place and I left. Uh, the people who are remaining there are the complainers and the people who never got it together to leave. Things like that, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and so it's... It, what I learned, so the nature of the resentment was often, you know, as ugly as that. But what it taught me is that we spend so much energy talking about what's wrong with each other, right? Whether we're talking about the rural folks talking about, you know, if only those city people could get it together to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, or it's the city people saying, if only the rural people could get it together and pull themselves up by the bootstraps. We're spending so much time talking about what's wrong with each other that we're not spending energy on fixing the system that's kind of... Um, how do I say this without swearing, that's, that's um, messing with all of us. And I say that because in the studies that look at um, what, especially on the federal level, the kind of policies that our representatives in Congress are voting for compared to what our preferences are, it's overwhelming evidence that the preferences that are most commonly represented are those of the very wealthiest, and the vast majority of the rest of us, our voices are not being heard. But we're not paying attention to that. Instead, we're paying attention to how can people be so stupid or how can people be so stupid. I, I've spent some time trying to understand why people don't believe in science, and that would go across the board to many things. Uh, and two quotes that came up uh, to me that stick in my mind, and I'd be curious about your thoughts, is that we're all still in high school and we're all lawyers. And I, I like those two quotes because it explains a lot of social pressure and ways we mm. uh, interact with one another. Just curious if what your response would be. Wow. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure about the we're all lawyers one. But we're all still in high school in some respects, I suppose. God forbid. <laughs> um, we all have uncertainties. We all want to be respected is kind of where my mind goes to about we're all still in high school. And we all, yeah, we all want um, to be valued and recognized. And it, it's, it's just basic human nature, right? That we, we all ought to be able to live the lives that um, we think are right 
and, and to be valued for that, respected for that. And I think when people feel like they're, um, they're breaking their backs and not being respected or not being valued, that nothing good is going to come of that, right? You can see how, I mean, resentment doesn't end, end up well, right? It doesn't go to a good place. Um, it's easy for, it's really fertile ground for someone to make use of that by tapping into kind of those basic human anxieties that we really experience in high school and that we hope <laughs> we mature out of, but we don't really. But um, the lawyer part, I'm not, I, would, I guess I would love your thoughts on how you see that playing out because... I would just take a stab at it, and I think I might not get at the crux of what you were, what you were aiming for. Yeah. Yeah. I. Or you can tell. I can repeat what you say. I can hear you. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Hank. The articles talk about motivated reasoning that we have belief systems and we're going because of what we believe pre-beliefs, pre, pre whatever new information wow. comes to us, we select out what we, that doesn't fit. We're all yeah. lawyers, you know, this, this doesn't oh. fit, guilty, not guilty. I see. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So that motivated reasoning is why we believe some of the lies that are being told when yeah. they're obviously lies, for instance. Uh, but we want to believe them because they fit into some some social structure, why yeah. we're all still in high school because that peer group is saying you, you we're supposed to believe this stuff. And or that motivated reasoning is it fits something else that has nothing to do with the actual topic, but yeah. you have this pre-belief that makes you lean that way to, to disbelieve a belief. Yeah. Uh, it's a, such an important point in our politics to these days because we all do that. I mean, and I should say, not even to the same degree, but it turns out that the people who are most politically interested and the most politi politically informed do it the most. So those of us who think and talk about politics a great deal, we are the most likely... We're, we're, we're the most likely to interpret information in a way that best fits with our predispositions and to screen out information that doesn't uh, kind of resonate with what we already think. Yeah. Thanks for raising that. Yeah. Oh. Um, so your book was about Wisconsin. How representative is your book of other rural, urban, divided states? Yeah. Well, it's not representative of every state, but of a lot of states in the country, and especially a lot of states in the upper Midwest, Michigan, Minnesota somewhat, Illinois, um, but other states around the country, generally those states where uh, there's a concentration of both uh, wealth and income, and sometimes also, especially when there's an uh, overlap with institutions of higher education, uh, New York State is a great case in point. Um, some of the states uh, out west, like uh, Washington, Oregon, um, uh, a little bit in the Dakotas, but it's it's uh, not necessarily. I'm not I'm not really convinced. This the dynamic is the same in the South, um, but across kind of the northern tier of the country. Uh, the dynamic that we're experiencing here in Wisconsin is, is similar to other states. But it also, in a way, Wisconsin is kind of a microcosm for the country as a whole in the way that we here in Wisconsin often feel disrespected and neglected and not getting our fair share of attention uh, compared to the coast. You know, people call us fly over land or whatever term they use and and I mentioned the news media before, and it's amazing how much information we get about snowstorms on the East Coast, right? We hear more about their weather than we hear about our own. <laughs> so uh, it, the dynamic, it's not exclusive to Wisconsin. And in some respects, what's going on here is just symptomatic of a broader phenomenon across the country. 
From your research um, throughout history, wouldn't you um, observe that people with wealth and power manipulate the, uh, the story to maintain that? And uh, the challenge is trying to get through that and understand what they're doing to manipulate yeah. us, the way they manipulate the story to manipulate us. I think. Yes, great point, Hank. Um, yeah. Yes, what more do I say to that except um, to go back to my earlier point, I think, about how much time we're spending focusing on the flaws of each other is distracting us, I think, from that exact thing, that, that task of figuring out how are we all being manipulated? How, what's going on that's causing us spend all this energy fighting with one another as opposed to figuring out what do we do to collectively to make us all better off. So thinking about the issue of like local news dying off for more national news, um, but also the like influx of social media in our lives, I was just considering like why isn't social media playing more of a role locally, whereas you know we're getting an influx of national news on social media yeah. as well? Um, and if you have any like advice on how to make that, how to make social media a place or a platform where it becomes easier to talk about these topics rather than just yeah. becoming a battle? Well, I'd love to know your thoughts before you give the microphone away, just of <laughs> of how you seeing it playing out locally. Like, are there cases where you see people using social media to, to maybe uh, accomplish something on the local level, whether it's just uh, becoming aware of a common concern or, or organizing to take care of some issue that's coming up around here. Do you ever see that kind of thing? Uh, I mean, organizing to a certain extent, but I also feel like once you put out your opinions of how you feel about something, which is yeah. usually how it is. Like you have to take that first initiative to put yourself out there. And then people are automatically like in a small town too, you're like, oh, I know that person, but like I had no idea that he felt that way about that. So now I've changed my opinions a little bit or, you know, and even trying not to change your opinions based on what they've said seems to be unfruitful because in the back of your mind, that division's still there. So, I, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I, it's, it's a problem. I mean, so many of us use social media to communicate, but I don't think the communication usually is not very healthy, right? And the platforms are created. I'm thinking primarily of Facebook and Twitter here. Sorry, Facebook and Twitter. But um, they're created so that we, that we're incentivized to post stuff that's provocative and is either going to get liked or retweeted. And it, they're not created so that we share in some kind of like collective sharing or, I mean, it's a, just a, such a different environment than the coffee clutch at the gas station where people share a lot about their lives and, and the good and the bad, right? What we get of each other on social media is really artificial in a lot of ways and is not is not the stuff of like a, an enduring friendship, right? Any other questions? I know I had one earlier and I got another question. In your interviews with the people around the state, could you give me the demographics of their age? Because this young lady yeah. just talked, and I really want to hear how the young people, are, because we need the young people, because yeah. they're our future. I'm with you. Okay. I did not talk with a lot of young people. Yeah. And I, it, it's a really open, important question, and I agree. Uh, there, yes, I would love to, I mean, I would love to do a study on the young people in the state in particular, yeah. And I'll just tell you that, you know, basically I chickened out is the answer because I was asking people, you know, where do I go in Manaqua? 
for example. I, Monaco was not one of my places, but we'll just use that as an example. Where do I go to hang out with people in their 20s and 30s on a place where you know, they normally get together to spend time with one another? Well, the tavern, right? Well, I, the few times I tried that, I just, I, I, you know, I, like, I remember I, I pulled into a, well, I shouldn't name the place, I pulled in this one, I, as I know it was a great tavern, but I pulled into the parking lot and I said to myself, how is this going to work? I'm going to walk in, I'm going to say, hi, I'm Kathy from Madison. Do you mind if I join you this evening? <laughs> like, I don't know. It probably would have been fine, right? I mean, I, I probably would have been yes. fine, but I chickened out. So I spent time with kids in 4-H clubs, but that's a, that's a different demographic. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the town you're from not seeming like a small town in the big perspective of Wisconsin. I was wondering, without naming it, can you talk about the smallest town you went to? Did it stick out? And do you remember anything specific from that town? Is this a quiz? <laughs> <laughs> or just anything from, from very, very small towns, you know? Yeah. In this you know, they... Um, what sticks out to me is that when I would go to a place that, um, so I'll give you a concrete example. There was one place I spent time in where I spent time in the basement of a church, uh, like a middle of a weekday morning, because there was no gas station, there was no business in town, but there was a church, and everybody around knew that at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays, that's kind of where you go. And so it was a wide range of people. Some folks were retired, some stay-at-home moms. But people, so a lot of people who were working who just knew that, like, on Tuesdays I take a break at this time because I'm going to meet up. And what I learned from that is what I thought was this tiny hamlet, this tiny little town, was actually this huge, vibrant community. That's what I learned. Like, there's, ti there's tiny towns according to the census, I guess you could say, but... There's a lot going on. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Hi. Oh, so I'm sorry. You. I haven't, probably haven't looked nope. at you the I'm whole time. I'm hiding behind yeah. you. Okay. Um, okay. In the last eight years or so, we've had the Walker administration. And before that, Wisconsin at different periods had been considered fairly progressive as far as the environment and protecting our waters and such. And Governor Walker, of course, said we're open for business and we have Foxcom and we have the fast track for mining. We have a golf course at Black River mm -hmm. and stuff that basically mm -hmm. show where his priorities are. Are we in a position to, and do the people that you've been talking to, do they see us overcoming this economic pressure to always provide, you know, growth engines and jobs and basically opportunities for business people to, you know, make more money? Hmm. I would say most of the folks I talked to who, who talked about supporting Governor Walker, so there, there are folks who told me that they voted for him or supported him, don't see it that way, you know? They, um, instead it was often, uh, well, two things. One, uh, I'm not going to vote for a Democrat because they... Um, and this is my paraphrase, but they represent things that I don't believe in, or they're, they're people like those urban elites that look down on people like me. Or um, I'm not going to vote for a Democrat because look around here, and you tell me that whatever government's been doing is working for people like me. And why would I ever want more government? I'm not going to vote in a Democrat who's going to ask for more government programs and take more of my money to create more government programs. So oftentimes they're not, they weren't really talking about um, being open for business or Walker being good for business, but um, talking about how 
they're, they didn't see much to like in Democrats. Yeah. I apologize if you touched on this in your book. I haven't read it yet. Oh, that's quite all right. <laughs> um, in your travels, uh, you said that you asked about what you what folks wished that the university could do in their communities. Yeah. Were you able to take any of their suggestions and bring it back to the university to implement? Yeah, thankfully. I mean, it. it yes, so I'll give you a couple examples, but it, it that taught me just how important it is, I mean, it taught me how important it is to have people associated with the university who are out and about in the state listening and understanding what people's concerns are. Because there's no shortage of people at UW-Madison who actually want to do right by the people of the state, but often there's, there's not often the mediator, right? People connecting folks on campus with the needs of the people in the state and hearing them firsthand. But the other thing I learned is just how valuable our extension system is because that's what they do, right? I mean, are any of you here in, in, involved with the extension? Sort of? Yeah, awesome. So that, I mean, that was the uh, part of the idea or behind extension originally, but it, it, I became such a huge extension fan through doing this work because I realized if you were going to create a system that did exactly the thing that we need in order to connect the people of the state with our research institutions, it would look much like the university extension system. So um, concretely, um, there was, well, I don't, I don't know how specific I can get about this, but there was one time when a woman, first time I met her back in 2007, said, you know, my husband passed away three weeks ago, and I didn't realize until he died that you could donate tissue. Like, I knew you could donate organs, but I didn't know anything about tissue donation. and could we do a kind of symposium up here where people from the university come out and, and talk about issue, tissue donation because we, there should be more awareness of it. And it didn't take that many phone calls for, it, for the ball to get rolling. And, you know, I think maybe it was a year later that there was a symposium in, northern, in a northern Wisconsin community. And the other example is a lot like that too, but it doesn't... It requires an extension system to, to and and others. I mean, um, yeah, to maintain that link, right? Like researchers, like at the Trout Lake Station, being out here, interacting with people, understanding what what the needs and concerns are, to be able to communicate it back. Thank you. Mm -hmm.